Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome again. My name is Reverend James Sessoms, and I'm going to be teaching a lesson today, a continued lesson, on the basic doctrines of the Bible. Uh, we're on uh, lesson number three, and we're going to be talking about a lot of scriptures today, sharing a lot of scriptures with you. And we're going to be talking about the essence of who God is. And I think you're going to be really blessed by it. It's so important for us to understand and uh, come to the realization of who God is and what his character is. And the more we understand about his presence in our lives and our hearts, the greater the relationship and the stronger the relationship becomes. So let's get right into it. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, session number three, the essence of who God is. Let's pray. Father, we just ask, oh God, that you uh, anoint this message. Let it be an encouragement and a strength to those who hear it. And Lord, we know that your word will not return void but you will send it out and it will not become void. And we give you praise and thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So the objective, the objective of this study, uh, in this study, we'll see that God is a spirit and he therefore has no limitations of space and time. And the key verse uh, for this particular uh, lesson, number three, is found in John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24. It says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, that's a powerful statement that John writes there through the unction of the Holy Spirit. He says that God is a spirit. And those of us who ex have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior and who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, those of us must worship him. Didn't give an option, did it? Said must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we saw in our last study that God has revealed himself to us. He wants us to know him and to make his glory known in the world. The commandment to love God with all of our heart is only possible if God can be known and desires to be known. Now, as I said earlier, we're gonna be reading a lot of scriptures today. So uh, write them down or watch this video as many times as you need to, to get the whole truth of what we're going to be teaching today. The first scripture that we're going to be talking about is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 and it says thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart soul and with all thy might. Now he says that we as individuals we love the Lord we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. Isn't that wonderful? To know that we can give everything to our loving Heavenly Father. Give it all to him and be blessed as you do. The second scripture is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment now from the new Te old testament to the new testament we see how the holy spirit allowed mark to write not only the similar verse of deuteronomy but he says two other things. He says you must love the Lord with all your mind, with all, not the intellectual mind, 
but the mind that has been renewed by the washing of the water of the word. And he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your strength. Everything that we do, all that we do, let's do it for the glory of God. Let's have our strength renewed day by day. Hallelujah. And he says, this is the first commandment. So we know right off the bat that we must love the Lord our God. With all there is within us, we must love him. In order to love God truly and fully, we must know who he is. All of scripture reveals the character of God. This is why we must study and teach the Bible. We'll be doing this as we study the most basic qualities of God. Now listen to this statement here. I, I, I really enjoy this statement. I think it's a powerful statement. It says, in this study, we'll look at eight qualities that describe God's existence. Eight qualities. God is a spiritual being. We should listen carefully to how Jesus described God's character. Speaking to the Samaritan woman, Jesus said that God is a spirit in John 4, verse 24. This is the most basic thing Jesus said about God, and it's where we should begin. Let's look at the context of what Jesus said in that particular chapter and verse in John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming. Oh, boy, is it true. The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus was talking to this woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman, and uh, he says to her that you don't know what you worship, but our worship is true because the God that we worship is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as the God of the New Testament and the person of Jesus Christ. And we need to have that confidence to be able to share with others that God is a spirit. And those that worship God must learn to worship him in the spirit. Jesus is saying that God is not limited to any place. He is not found to be found in a single holy mountain or a single holy city. Since he does not have a bodily form, this is why the children of Israel were uh, com <coughs> commanded not to make representations of God. Images of God always lead to idolatry because we start to worship the physical image itself. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now let's look at that. Let's get a definition of that found in the scripture. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 and 4. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. This is the revelation of the Old Testament that God says you can't have two masters. You can't have two gods. You must worship God. You must worship him 
in spirit and in truth. You must acknowledge him and recognize that he is Lord over your life. Christ is the only representation of God in bodily form. He is therefore worthy of our worship. Hallelujah. I love to worship God. I love to praise his holy name and magnify him. Now the next uh, verse we're going to read is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. That says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Hebrews 1 and 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, when Christ went to the cross and died and was raised from the dead, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He purged our sins as if we had never sinned and sat down right beside the Father on his right hand and his majesty on high. And I believe with all my heart today that we're in a place where the worshipers, the true worshipers, are going to worship God even greater in spirit and in truth. Now, the third verse that we're going to talk about is found in John 20 and verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Hallelujah. Have you said that about God today? Have you said that? He has to be your Lord and your God. He's my Lord and my God. I thank him every day. I don't. I try not to ever wake up and not thank him for what he's done for me and all the beautiful blessings that he's given me. But he's just not Jehovah. He is my Lord and he is my God. I make it personal. And you need to learn to make it personal in your own life. If God is a spirit, then why does the Old Testament say that he has eyes, ears, and arms? Well, Let's look to the scripture to talk about it. In Psalms 34, verse 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. So see, we, we have this uh, study, even though God is a spirit, and we know that Christ took on uh, the form of a man, we see the difference between the old and the new, but yet there had to be a, a parallel, something relevant that people could understand so that they could get an image of that. And so Psalms and other scriptures that we'll be going over talks about this, it says the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. God looks upon the righteous and he sees them and he hears their cry. And he opens up his ears and his eyes to see. Isaiah 59, verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Isn't that wonderful? Not only can does God see us and hear our prayers and understand our pain and our suffering, but his hand is not shortened that he cannot save. There's no way that God is too far away or too close away that he cannot save us from ourselves, that he cannot save us from the troubles and the trials and the situations that we get in. But he, he has to be the Lord of your life. He has to be the desire of your heart. And if you've not uh, allowed that to happen, make him Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to come in Allow the Spirit of God to come in and refresh you and renew you and give you a new beginning. God is described to us in terms that we can understand. But he is not limited by a physical body or by physical space. 
He is not bound by time, and he needs nothing outside of himself. The spiritual nature of God, therefore, is the most basic thing we must know about God's existence. Now, I want to read that again, because I want, to, I want you to get the whole comprehension of it. It says the spiritual nature, the nature of God, just like the characteristics of God. The nature of God is the most basic thing that we must know about God's existence. Now, the first quality that we're going to see, remember I said there's going to be eight qualities that we're going to go over. Number one is this. God has no beginning and no end. He's eternal. Unlike the things of this world, God has no beginning and no ending. Now, the first verse that we're going to see that relates to that is found in Psalms 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were bought, brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Hallelujah. Before anything was brought forth, even before you formed the earth and the world, you were everlasting to everlasting, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Thou art God. That's powerful. So we can know one of the qualities of God. The next verse and chapter is found in Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, For thus saith the High and Lofty One, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. See, God is, God is holy and he's just and he's merciful and he's good and he's kind. All those characteristics of God are true. But he's also able to revive those who feel distraught and overwhelmed and discouraged. He's to revive the heart of the broken ones and those who feel like giving up and feel like there is no hope in this world that we live in. God is a good God. And we need to tell the story. Now, the second quality we want to go to is God needs nothing outside of himself. All living things rely upon other things to live and survive. This is true for people, animals, and plants. But the one who created all things is entirely sufficient in himself. He doesn't need anyone to explain his existence. He tells us who he is, shares with us his qualities and his character, and then we have to believe. The first verse that we want to go that helps us to understand that is found in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. It says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temple made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You see, God is all-knowing, all-seeing. He's everywhere. He can be all things to all men at the time that he needs to be, but he doesn't need to uh, share with us that he personally needs anything. He is the one who gives life and breath and all things to you and I. But he himself has no need of anything. If God does not need anything, then why did he create the world? Oh, that's a good question. Good question. God certainly does not need us but he wants us, hallelujah. He wants us 
to reflect his glory, to fellowship with him, and to share in his life forever. That's a wonderful statement. It's a wonderful statement that you need to rehearse over and over in your heart to know that even though God doesn't need us, he wants us and he wants to share his life with us forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Now this next verse helps to define that. In Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. You see, God describes right there that everyone that is called by his name, everyone that he knows by name, everything and everyone that God created him for his glory. He says, I formed him and I made him so that he and I could have fellowship one with another. Isn't that powerful today? Don't you see more and more of how God's existence is so real today? The study of this doctrines of the Bible and the fact that God's existence is real. We're seeing it right here in these scriptures. We're hearing it. Some of you may be for the first time, but God is so real that he can touch us at the moment we need him to touch us even though he doesn't need us to do anything. He wants us to have fellowship with him. <coughs> now let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare. We declare it unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Did you see the importance of that? The true fellowship of our worship before the Lord is with our Heavenly Father. This is one of the times right now where you first hear in this lesson that we're teaching the word Father, Abba, Daddy, he says, if you know me, if you know my character, if you know that I exist, I'm not only the high and holy and lifted up one. I not only created the heavens and the earth and formed you, and made you and created you in my image. But he says, I, I am also a father. I understand how to come to you and to give you comfort and strength when you need it. That's why it's, he's called Abba, Abba Father. I remember when my brother, when, when they had their uh, daughter, Grace, we would go over to their house to visit. And when she could walk and talk, she would say, not daddy or father, she would say Abba, Abba, where are you, Abba? And I thought that was so loving and so wonderful and so beautiful because she knew who her father was. That when she called out that name, he would come running. He would come to her and he would give her that comfort that she was looking for. In John 17, verse 21, we read, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Again, we hear Jesus saying, Father, he's our dad. He's our comforter. He's here in our hearts and lives. If you know him as Lord and Savior, he lives and dwells within us today. And he says, it's important to understand that is the Father 
and the Son are one, so must we be one with the Father and the Son, all, all of us together as one, not separate, not different religions, but all one in Christ, so that we may dwell in the presence of God and be enriched to the truth that God exists today. The third quality that we want to talk about, God always remains the same. The things of this world change and pass away. They do, don't they? Uh, I've seen uh, 68 years old and I've seen so many things change and pass away. A lot of things have changed and pass away since I was a youngster. But look at what 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 says. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In other words, heaven and earth can pass away. But God's, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. That's obedience to God. Obedience to the purpose that God has for you. Walking in divine purpose, walking in divine obedience helps you to understand that if this earthly world passes away because you are in Christ Jesus, you abide forever in the bosom of the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's look at another one. This is one of my favorite uh, books of the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes. And in chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Oh, I love that verse. To everything. You can't be confused by that. To everything there is a season. Now that word season could mean uh, a period of time that's short or it could mean a period of time that is long. But whatever it is, short or long, there's, there's always a purpose in it. And that purpose is, is to fulfill God's will while it's being done, whether short or long. And it says, any time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time for it. Every purpose has God's timing in the midst of it. And then it goes on to quote this in verse 2. It says, a time to be born and a time to die. Time to plant and time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. But you couldn't have all of that if you didn't know that first verse. If you didn't know that first verse that says, to everything there is a season and a time. To everything. God has purposed in all of eternity that there are seasons and times when all these things that we just read in these verses two through eight to happen and you can understand it as long as you understand that first verse as long as you grab a hold of that first verse and recognize that there is a purpose for it there is a season in which they take place and there is a time god's divine plan being fulfilled and so it's very important to know that god alone never changes Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it's for, it says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God is saying, 
I'm the Lord. I am. I don't change. I don't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. Hebrews 13 verse 8 even says this even more. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. I just said that. But the verse verifies it. Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday, he is the same today, and he is the same forever. Boy, there, how many people do you know that are wishy-washy? One day they're this, the next day they're that. One day they're up, the next day they're down. No, not God. He's the same all the time. Very solid. Very at rest with who he is. And knows what we need before we ask. God doesn't panic. Number four, in the qualities of God, God never changes his mind. His purposes are eternal. Let's look at uh, chapter and verse that talks about this. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall not he do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? In other words, just like Isaiah said, the word that goes forth, God's word does not return void. God's word is consistent. God's word is always speaking truth, never err, never up and never down, always to be handled and know that you can take it to the bank. He always makes his word good. In Hebrew, Hebrews 6, verse 17, it says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. He confirmed it by an oath. He said, Because I could swear by no greater, I swore to myself. God says, There's no one greater than I. I am the high and lofty one. I am eternal, without an end and without a beginning. Therefore, because of that, I confirmed it by an oath. And my oath was that when I spoke it into existence, it came into existence. You can take God's word and never have to worry about it being doubt, full of doubt or unbelief or maybe it will or maybe it won't. God's word is all truth, all knowing and all powerful. Hallelujah. Why does then the Bible speak about God as though he does change his mind? Oh, that's a good question. Many people have said, well, it looks like to me that God changed his mind uh, several times in the Bible. Well, let's look at it. Because God is described to us in human language, in the only ways we can understand, we're going to read some passages that speak of God's sorrow and God's mercy. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, listen to this. And it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him in his heart. Now that looks like that God changed his mind. But that's not what it says, because see, that's just an English version. That's just a version of the English translation. But if you look at it from a spiritual standpoint, it grieved the heart of God that man, whom he created in his image, would want to sin. They would want to partake in sin. How, how could an everlasting father look to his sons and daughters and say, why would you want to sin? Why would you want to uh, fall from the goodness and mercy and from the grace of God? I know everything. You can't hide from me. And so we recognize that God does not repent and change his mind. But it does teach us that God is saying, because of all these things that we just talked about in these prior verses, 
and these prior scriptures. God says, why would you want to have any other God? Why would you want to have any other truth than what you're reading today? Isn't that wonderful? In John 3, verse 10, it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their uh, evil way, and God repented of the evil. And he, had, and, and he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Again, people would say that's a controversial verse. It says that God changed his mind. He, oh, well, I'm gonna, I was going to do evil, but no. God says, I saw your good deeds. I saw the things that you did, and I recognize that you did them from your heart, not from your head. You didn't do it because you thought you had to. You did it because the Spirit of the living God resides inside of you. And because the love of God is in your heart today and in your spirit and in your soul, God said, I, how can I bring evil upon them? I can't because I see what's in the heart, not what's in the outward appearance. Praise God that he doesn't judge us according to our outward appearance. Number five, God is completely powerful. Everyone can see the power of God in nature. If God created all things, then God is completely powerful and nothing is too hard for him. God, I mean, when you go outside in the morning, or the evening, or whenever it might be, you see the nature of God. You see the heavens. You see the stars at night. You see the moon. You see the beauty of the trees and the flowers and all the animals, everything that God created. And you see it. And because he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-seeing, there's nothing too hard for him. He created it. And on the seventh day, he rested. He said it was good. That word good in the, good in the uh, Hebrew is tov, T-O-V. In other words, he saw everything that he did. And he says, I can't do anything better. This is good. What I've spoken into existence is good and perfect. And because I can't change it, because I see that everything I did was perfect, I'm going to call it good. <laughs> I'm going to say, that's it. Don't need to improve it. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Well, we don't want to go too deep into these scriptures but I pray that you'll study them. Uh, our time is getting short. So take these scriptures and pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Find concordances and various types of uh, books that you can, the Holy Spirit can help you to understand more and more about the depths of God and his existence. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, it says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, see, there it was, Ecclesiastes 3. At the time appointed, I will return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God promised Abraham that out of his loins a son would be born. And it was so. And he says, at the time appointed to everything there is a season and a time and, and and God says to Abraham is there anything too hard for me I heard you laughing I heard Sarah laughing there's nothing too hard for me at the time that I have appointed God says I'm going to come back and Sarah your wife she will have a son that sums it all up God's existence is real. If God is completely powerful, then why does he allow sin to continue? He does. Why does he allow suffering? 
We need to remember two biblical truths that answer these questions. God gave man a choice to be obedient or disobedient to him. And number two, God will eventually judge all sin. All sin. So those are two biblical truths that we can uh, sink our teeth in to know more about God. The sixth principle of the qualities of God is God knows everything. The prophecies in the Old Testament tell us about God's complete knowledge. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. That's probably one of the most uh, talked about verses about the standing fast and what God did and what he created. And you need to mark that in your Bible and keep it near your heart. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Psalms 139 verse 1 through 6 says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my sitting down and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain unto it. We have to know that all of this, God's ways are higher than ours, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Paul tells us that all knowledge and wisdom are found in the person of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 2, 3, it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If God knows everything, then why do we pray? Doesn't God already know what's going to happen? Yes. But we pray because God has commanded us to come with him with our needs. This is one of the ways we worship him. As we declare our complete dependence upon him. God is everywhere, number seven. God is everywhere. God is not limited by space or time. He is present everywhere at all times. Psalms 139 says it. says, Whither shall I go from your sight? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I go to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thou uh, there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall uphold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the, the, right, even the night shall be a, a flight about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Again, God is allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to the writers and to teach us and show us that God is everywhere. He exists. He is everywhere. And we need to have faith and know that in our hearts today. In Proverbs 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. If God is everywhere, then how can anyone be separated from God? God can withdraw himself from mankind. He will withdraw his presence eternally from those who do not believe. You see, this is about a personal relationship between God and man, not a water spigot that you turn on and turn off. When if we're committed to God, let us walk with God. And then finally, number eight, God is the ruler of everything. As we have seen, God is completely powerful. He knows all things and is present everywhere. God is also the rightful ruler over all things. We acknowledge his complete authority when we call him Lord. At the end of time, 
Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And my last verse is found in Philippians 2, verse 11. And it says, And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What should our response be when we think of how great God is? As we close this lesson out today, and you ponder in your heart what we've read, what the Holy Spirit is teaching us, we should worship Him, since He alone is worthy. We should thank Him for allowing us to know Him and live with Him forever. And we should trust Him to provide for our needs. My prayer today is, that you will take and grab a hold of this word, and let it go down deep into your heart, your soul, and your spirit. And it will answer all the questions you had about the existence of God. We've read enough scripture and talked enough about it that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does exist. And he is real. And he wants to be a part of your life. That's why he created you. That's why he molded you and shaped you in his image. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to share this word today. And I hope that you'll truly be blessed in Christ's name. Amen.